This meeting is being recorded. Today is April 13th, 2022, and we are in the third uh, track of uh, environmental disasters in our summit this year for pandemics and disasters and ontologies. So it gives me pleasure to welcome all of you. And for our distinguished speaker today, I'm inviting our uh, co-champion, Gary Birdcross, to introduce uh, the speaker of today. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, so when we decided to have a track on environmental disasters, the first person many of us thought of was Christoph Janowitz or Jano, as many of us who know him call him. So we're very happy that he's able to make some time to share some of his insights uh, work. And uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers because you can learn a lot from Jano uh, during questions and answers. So Jano is now a full professor for geoinformatics at the University of Vienna in Austria, as well as the director of the Center for Spatial Studies, the University of California, Santa Barbara. As he says, he likes to keep busy. His research focus on how humans conceptualize space around them based on their behavior, focusing particularly on regional and cultural differences with the ultimate goal of assisting machines to better understand the information uh, needs uh, of an increasingly diverse user base. Gana describes his expertise as including in knowledge representation and reasoning as they apply to spatial and geographic data that is in the form of knowledge graphs as you will talk about today. But his work and influence is far and wide and not the least of which is his role pro uh, prompting uh, semantic technology as a, and promoting I should say, uh, as a co-editor of the Semantic Web Journal where his editorial is going back decades have included the digital earth as a knowledge, en as a knowledge engine. In, in 2016, he co-edited ontology engineering with ontology design patterns, foundations and applications with Pascal Hitzler and Aldo Gangemi which is a, it's a very good source for some background on the things he'll talk about today. He's also been a frequent contributor to the Ontology Summit. We were tr actually trying to remember how far back it goes, probably back in 20, 2010 when he was at Penn State. In 2015, he spoke on ontology visualizations for smart environments where he discussed ontology design patterns as flexible plug and play reconfigurations of patterns with purpose in 2020, he presented on his knowledge, uh, Nowhere Graph work, we'll hear more about uh, today. He was also instrumental in developing the Lightwork SSN, or the Semantic Center Network Ontology as part of the W3C incubating group, as well as the follow-up SOSA, the Lightweight Sensor Observation Sampler and Actual Actuator Ontology. All of these you can read about, they're well published, Yano and others. Favorite of uh, ontology design patterns of mine is the geo ontology design pattern for semantic trajectories. Uh, since I was able to see this developed as part of the vocamp, with all that, Jano's talk today is entitled "Knowledge Graphs and Disaster Mitigation: A Match Made in Heaven or Hell." Let me turn it over to Jano now. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for this um, very very kind introduction. Gary, with all the praise that unfortunately I think I probably only partially deserve, but, but thank you so much for your kindness. Let me start with a couple of disclaimers. I, I accepted this on short notice, tried to put together uh, the, the best slides that I could. Some of you may, may have seen parts of this probably, so I, I hope you will still um, stay with me on that. I'm also in an Airbnb right now, so there will be maybe kids running around, dogs jumping, you will maybe hear somebody working in the kitchen. Nothing I can do about this. Just take it as part of the show. Take some popcorn and, and enjoy the ride in case, you know, kids come running across the table or other crazy things happen. So <clears throat> thanks again. I'm going to give you an update on the NOAA graph project and our application areas in disaster mitigation and humanitarian relief, as well as food and supply safety. I presented, as Gary mentioned, on the NOAA graph actually quite interesting now that I think about this. In 2020, when we were just starting the first phase of the project and we were competing with many other teams 
one of the spots in NSF's funded phase two. NSF is the National Science Foundation in the United States. And luckily we got this certainly also because of our chance to, to, to present the work to you guys and to practice and get your feedback. So I hope if you saw the initial presentation and you will be curious to see what did we do in the last 18 months, so to speak, since I, I gave the talk or maybe it's even a little bit longer, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. So let me dive right into this. So what is it that we are doing and um, why are we doing it in the first place? So let's start very, very, very broad, you know, big picture perspective first. In the field of research data management or data management, and of course, you know, nobody knows more about these fields than, than Gary. Probably the biggest foundational challenge is the interesting observation that very substantial parts of the innovation that we see in artificial intelligence research, machine learning research, data science, whatever you'd like to call this, comes or is at least heavily influenced by the availability of high quality, very large, rich, so you know, semantically heterogeneous data sets. So where are those data sets come from? And that's the interesting part. They come from what we call opportunistic reuse. So there's a data set out there, one that you haven't created, but somebody else created, and then you are using it for your own purpose. There's tons of very interesting examples, but that's not the point I want to make today. The point I want to make is that there's an interesting observation. First time I heard somebody talk about this was Frank von Habelen in his fantastic ISWC keynote in Bonn in 2011. But I guess the idea has been probably around for much longer, namely that there's an interesting relation between the quality of your data as it relates to your own initial use. So the reason why you collected and created the data in the first place versus the ability to reuse the very same data. <clears throat> Namely, the more suitable a data set is for your own purpose. And by your own, I mean for the person that created the data or the organization that created the data, the less reusable it is for others. And the more general purpose, so to speak, the data set is. So the more reusable it is the less useful it may be for any specific purpose. So the big foundational question here is, can we make useful data also reusable, right? Of course, that's a very, very big question. I'm not going to answer it today, or if you invite me back in 10 years, but there's a, there's a sub problem of this very large problem. Also very, very ambitious, but I think a little bit easier to handle also very well known, studied since probably the 80s. It goes by different names, so you may have heard it um, using uh, different terms before, and it goes by the name of the data acquisition bottleneck problem. Roughly speaking, it describes the interesting observation that any typical data-driven decision-making or data science project requires up to spending, requires spending up to 80% of all of your resources, be this person power, be this time or be this budget on what is called nowadays in data science, data wrangling or data massaging. So data discovery, data entry, data cleaning, data integration, these days, of course, checking the veracity of data and so forth. So 80% is spent on data preparation, so to speak, leaving only roughly speaking 20% for actually deriving insights of data. And I hope you agree with me, that's, not an acceptable situation, right? Because those last 20% determine the quality, the ultimate quality of the decisions you're going to take. And maybe even more important than just making poor decisions, which is already horrible in its own right. Keep in mind that this data acquisition bottleneck makes projects that are based on data-driven decision-making fail in many, in many cases, or reach or pass this first stage of, you know, getting data in shape, integrating the data, cleaning data, and by then, many projects have run out of time, relevance, or budget. So what is it that we, the Nowhere Graph project that I'm going to talk about today, and would like to do in this data acquisition bottleneck grant, so to speak? Well, what we do as an environmental platform or a geo or a spatial platform is that we are set out to provide area briefings for any place on the surface of Earth within seconds to help you answer questions like, what is here or what happened here before or who knows more about an area of interest or maybe even more interestingly 
how does this region that you selected, you know, a geographic region on the surface of the earth compare to other regions, either nearby or maybe very far away? Or how does one event that played out in a specific way in this region played out maybe similarly or maybe very differently in a different region? So the reason why we are doing this or the reason why we would like to provide such environmental intelligence, so to speak, for any region on earth is that we hope to help decision makers and data scientists to very rapidly enrich their own data, thereby raising their situational awareness, which, as you may know, contributes then to good decision making. If I would like to make the, you know, a very provocative or very ambitious statement, I would say that we hope for flipping or hope to flip this 80-20 um, bottleneck on its head so that hopefully in five years or 10 years, you're spending 20% of your time on data wrangling and 80% of your time on actually deriving insights out of data. So I used a lot of terms there, so let me dive a little bit into detail on at least some of them, namely situational awareness. So what is situational awareness? One of those terms used since many years in the literature. Here, what we mean essentially is the fact that to make good decisions, you need to understand the context in which decisions are made, right? The current political situation, the current struggles, for instance, with supply chains, current health issues, Today, we are supposed to talk about, about disasters and health risk. So this may also include um, anticipated storms, wildfires, or how multiple of those events play together. This is very common, unfortunately, now also back home in California, where, for instance, we had a very substantial wildfire directly followed by the first storm of the season that led to a landslide because the burned soil could no longer hold um, that capacity of water. And eventually, that was the one that killed so many people in our community and interestingly not the, the fire. So how do you get to situational awareness? Well, you can think about this as a four stage process and in fact five stages because ultimately you wanna take some action, right? But the situational awareness is only the first four stages. So the first stage is often called the perception stage. In the perception stage, you're retrieving information, you're cleaning information, you're monitoring data, you're trying to understand for a good decision about this crisis, for a good decision about this hurricane, this cholera outbreak, this, uh, this uh, tornado, what do I need to know? I need to know about people, about people at risk, about smartphone availability, about transportation infrastructure, about food supply, about shelters and so on, right? So I'm trying to gather data, that's the perception. In the comprehension stage, then I'm trying to synthesize this. Okay, so the, good need, the goods need to be transported on, on highways. There will be population that is going to be more affected in more rural areas or population with other risks like diabetes or obesity and so on. So I'm synthesizing the data, I'm integrating the data and I'm giving it my situational dependent interpretation. Once I'm done with this, and keep in mind our argument is that this is going to take you 80% of all of your time, right? Once this is done, we are moving on to the perception phase, namely where we try to use this now what we learned to anticipate to learn from the past, so to speak, how this specific disaster is going to play out. And of course, this doesn't only apply to disasters, but you know, it's today's topic, so I'm going to stick with these examples. Or you would like to extrapolate. This is how things were in the past. Hopefully, things will play out similarly so that I can understand how, how to deal with this. And once you did this projection, the next step would be, of course, decision-making followed by action. So what we are trying to do with the nowhere graph, we are trying to really fast forward through the perception and comprehension stage. We are trying to rapidly accelerate this. So to give relief specialists, supply chain specialists, data-driven decision makers, data scientists, enough time for the projection of the system stage where really you know, human capabilities and human level intelligence isn't yet surpassed by, by machine intelligence, at least you know, for the next few years. You may, of course, know that these issues are not exactly new, as I said. For instance, for the data acquisition bottleneck, there are several partial solutions how to overcome this, or at least mitigate the effects of this. One of them in our realm of environmental and geographic and geospatial information is what's called geo-enrichment. There are many providers of geo-enrichment. Probably the most well-known is S3, the world's leading company for geographic information systems and they offer a service where running by the name or going by the name of geoenrichment and in a nutshell it works like this in times of for instance crisis but of course also during any other time 
you take your own data and instead of trying to download more data, clean the data, integrate the data, check the veracity of data, you are immediately reaching out to the cloud, to their web service, to get streaming access to up-to-date data, just particularly tailored to your own area of study. And, and please keep this in mind, this is very important. You're not just going to some portal and downloading data and then making everything on yourself. You're really selecting your own study area and then getting data just pre-apportioned, as we say, to the study area. Here you see an example, the, all the red polygons are past fires. The one with the Turkos outline is the Thomas fire up to 2018. That was the largest fire in the history of California. Of course, now every new year is every is the new biggest fire in the history of California. Unfortunately, that work burned very close to home in the Santa Barbara and Montecito region. The picture here is actually from my window, not from this fire, but from the fire next year, just to show, you know, they get close to home. If this is the view from your window, it can get a little bit scary if you're not used to California. So what are you going to do? You're going to start the service. This is the part that you're seeing on the, on the right-hand side with the big yellow arrow. Namely, you're getting now streaming access to information that you didn't have. In my case, for a specific sub-area, the Montecito area, where you know, many of the Hollywood stars are living, I'm asking for people who have smartphones and then people over the age of 65, who at least theoretically speaking, may have a little bit of a harder time, for instance, to evacuate quickly, right, right there, you know, at the risk of, of struggling to evacuate quickly. So again, you have your own data and then you increase your situational awareness by reaching out on the fly to an external data source, data service, in fact, and then you get streaming data on demand. So this is really, really cool, really revolutionary, tried out, it's a very impressive technology but it comes with quite some limitations. So let me talk about the pros first and then about the cons. On the pro side, well, you get data on demand. If you are a data scientist, you know exactly that the worst thing that can happen to you is download really, really big data sets, terabytes of data and have them sit and age on your hard disk. You don't know whether there's a new version. You don't know whether there's an update to the data or metadata or whether errors have been fixed. So here you get data on demand, right? The data is also well curated. It comes from a trusted source, at least if you trust S3, and again, they are the largest provider of geographic information systems. So typically, geoinformation systems, data users, so to speak, would trust them. The data is also apportioned, which means that, again, you're not just downloading some big chunk of data set. You're really getting information specifically custom tailored to your study. Right? And of course, it's ready for direct consumption in a geographic information system, but in theory also a statistical environment like R or MATLAB or something like this. Okay, so which problems aren't solved yet? Well, even though S3 in theory can serve a lot of categories where they really shine is demographic data. That's why I also showed you the example of people over the age of 65 or people with smartphones. So, what you can't easily do is you can't say, well, I'm getting the demographic data from S3, I'm getting the transportation data from somebody else, I'm getting data from the, about a fire, for instance, or an earthquake from yet another party. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. You're, you're really locking yourself into you know, yet another data silo, so to speak, which I hope you agree with me is exactly what we are not trying to do in, in, in 2022. Right? The data is also flat or, or tabular. And what I mean by that is that once you download that once you re-enrich your data, you can't do any follow-up queries. You can't say, oh, that's interesting. Now I would like to learn more about, about this area or about the population in the area, right? And then finally, and most importantly for our applications, the data or re-enrichment still doesn't solve the data integration problem you're still downloading in this old geographic information systems or geodata paradigm of layer by layer by layer, like a transportation layer, a population area, layer health area, and, and agricultural supply chain layer. And then you still have to do all the integration yourself, right? So luckily, as, as you guys in this community know very, very well, there's a technology since a couple of years, in fact, a decade by now, that excels at exactly this integration, right? And those are knowledge graphs. I know that all of you probably have different opinions about what are the key value propositions, what is the, the, you know, the magic source, the secret source of knowledge graphs. I'm going to give you my view here. Of course, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So you know, in the discussion later, feel free to disagree or tell me that you have another 
view on what makes knowledge graphs so strong. In my personal view, when I try to explain this to people to, to have never worked, who have never worked with knowledge graphs, I would always say that they emphasize relationships in addition or over attributes, right? So it's not that you would say there's a fire called the Thomas fire. It has this in this area and there's Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara has this amount of population and stuff like this. Knowledge graphs really excel at saying the Thomas fire is located in Santa Barbara. In fact, it's located in Ventura County and Santa Barbara County. Those two counties are adjacent. The Thomas fire happened very late in the burning season. Therefore, there was a freak storm directly after the fire burned. So, you know, there's also a temporal topology here, so to speak, right? That a freak storm caused a mudslide. That mudslide killed 20 in our community in Montecito. It cut us off from Highway 101, which is our major transportation access to the south. So you're seeing what I'm doing, right? I'm, I'm building relations between people, places, event, goods, and so on. I think there's no technology that is really as good at this as knowledge graphs. Also, and this is particularly important to people who are from coming from the data provider perspective, because it's very easy for them to confuse this. Knowledge graphs are not about data sets, right? We are not describing like, you know, metadata about this data set, metadata about this data set. They really connect individual data observations, individual data items, so to speak. One specific fire, the Thomas fire, with one specific area where it burned, for instance, at the Barbara County, right? And they do so across themes. You, you saw me doing this in my in my anecdote, right? I talked about the highway, I talked about transportation, Los Angeles, Ventura County, Santa Barbara County, and so on, right? <clears throat> then, and this is what I think personally is the biggest secret source of knowledge graphs, is they break apart the data metadata distinction. If you are working in research data management or you're creating data, you know that creating metadata, understanding which metadata will be used in the future, keeping metadata up to date is a really, really big, big pain. So what we do with knowledge graphs and semantics, and of course ontologies, that's why I'm here at the Ontology Summit, right? Is we make the data smart, right? By breaking apart the data to metadata distinction. We make data self-descriptive by giving them a rich semantics and thereby we can develop you know, dumb or simple or off the shelf software to become intelligent by using intelligent data instead of trying to develop intelligent software on dumb data, which is something that has been done for many, many years and, and never really worked because, you know, developing smart software is really, really difficult. Of course, the data is also machine readable and machine readable. You know this, it comes with the semantics and not just some semantics, semantics but one that is um, represented in some form of knowledge representation language like RDF or OWL or something like this. So it comes also with a formal semantics then allow, that allows for reasoning and data conflation and so on and so forth. One thing that always strikes me about these knowledge graphs is that if you really study them and if you investigate their, their graph structure, you will see that geographic places like regions, cities, mountains, what have you, play a key role in acting as nexus. So in really bringing information about people, events, places, and so on together. Yet those knowledge graphs like DBpedia, Wikidata, and so on, have relatively little information about these places. You typically find the type of place like a city or county or something like this. You may find inhabitants, you may find elevation data, sometimes, you know, something like population density, but basically this is it, right? So, Keep also in mind that one of the key advantages of knowledge graphs is not just that there's just one graph, like the one that I'm talking about today, the nowhere graph, but of course those graphs form an ecosystem themselves, right? So here you see Wikidata in the middle and many other knowledge graphs surrounding them. And of course they link to each other so that once you have information for your situational awareness, for instance, for humanitarian relief, you can reach out to all the other knowledge graphs using federated queries and get your hands on so much more data, right? Of course, to do so, you first need to do a couple of steps like a deduplication or in fact entity resolution that for instance, the Vienna in one knowledge graph is the V in another knowledge graph, or you would have to do the very same by establishing alignment relations on the class and relationship levels so the T box, so to speak, by saying that the disaster in one graph is same as a disaster in another graph or how terms like disaster and hazards um, how those are related, right? 
So back to back to us. What we are doing as the NOAA graph project is that we are at least to, to, to my understanding, the very first to bring those two ideas that I introduced to you together, the knowledge graphs on the one hand side and the geo enrichment on the other side. So we give you geo enrichment as a way to rapidly gain information, situation awareness about your area of interest. Very important as I will show you in a couple of minutes for disaster mitigation, but we are doing it from an open ended knowledge source of billions of billions of connected statements across multiple knowledge graphs and that's exactly the, the knowledge graph part of nowhere graph so let me give you one intuition how how this could work and how this works so let's say you're interested in a specific hurricane that hit a part of texas in 2020 that's the what part of the slide here so you know there's a hurricane and it hit this part for instance in this case orange in 2020, and now you would like to learn more about orange, right? So you're going to the where part of the graph, and here you can immediately learn about orange, about the population of orange, the health issues, in our case, for instance, obesity, diabetes, and so on. But you can also learn about other things of, in orange, namely how orange has been affected not only by this hurricane, but all the previous other disasters in our data set, even going back to the 50s. And you can always ask for damage to property, damage to life, damage to agriculture, which is a very part, big part of our application areas. So now you learned about orange, so to speak, and now you ask yourself, wait, wait a minute, but the, the hurricane didn't only hit orange, it hit all its neighboring communities as well, right? Was there something about orange that made it less or more affected by this particular event? So you can go to the how part of the graph and explore the entire storm episode. So the storm moving in first as a hurricane and then as a tropical storm through Texas and other parts of the United States. So you can click and visualize all the data from the nearby communities and then ask the same questions. What happened there before, right? Were they more or less affected? Is the damage similar? Is the population structure similar? And you can all do this by really, you know, as they say, following your notes. And then you can do one thing that for you guys, as ontologists and knowledge graph folks is kind of trivial, but for, for a classical database person, it's going to blow their mind. You can make the very simple realization that hurricanes are not only real world entities like events, right? But they also related to a, an intellectual topic or you know an abstract idea of being able to study hurricanes, which means that you can also ask for people who have expertise in hurricanes, in this case, Michael Montgomery. So we have also a very large data set of experts with the expertise and matching this expertise to disaster topics so that you can immediately try to get the right boots on the ground, understand who knows more about a certain region and a certain topic. <clears throat> so who benefits from all this, right? Who is this designed for? Of course, as a knowledge graph and a service stack, it could be used in many cases, but we do have four different ideas, so to speak, or in fact, pilots and prototypes to showcase that this really works and that this can be really used. They're in different stages. Let me be very clear about this. Some of them are us talking to partners in government agencies and industries. Some of this is us having have many interviews with them, collaborating with them, sharing ideas and data with them. And some is, you know, really, sitting since two years with them in the same teleconference every week and really hammering out software and trying and testing and really you know having this production ready so let me be very clear it's not all done right this is what we are working with, so to speak it's work in progress so for instance we are we are working with the food industry association in the united states to enhance the uh, sustainability efficiency and safety of consumer food supply and one of the things that we are particularly interested in is that now that wildfire season is all season, for instance, in California and Washington, Oregon, it also matches growing season. So for the first time, we have questions like, what does the smoke and the, the, the ashes from wildfires do to leafy greens? Now, how does the smoke from the wildfires that, of course, covers a substantially larger area than the fire itself, taints with its smoke and the grapes that, of course, then are not able to be used for the wining industry, which for us in California, it's a, it's a really big concern, right? We are also working with uh, farm credit associations. In fact, they, you know, we have, uh, we have uh, we had a couple of standing meetings 
to introduce them to our ideas and feel out what, what they think or how they could use the graph to understand land valuation in the time of crisis change and to be better to better able to predict risk of default. So given that you would like to give credit to a, to a farmer for buying another field or maintaining field or buying machinery, what is their risk of default giving more fires, more draws, more cascading events, worker health being affected by the ashes and so on. And we also, you know, building our bridges on reaching out to the community surrounding topics like earthquakes and simulations, large scale simulations in the central United States of earthquakes to really try to use the nowhere graph as a data backbone so that decision makers on the government level can very quickly assess the situation. They can run a scenario, say, let's say an earthquake happens here, tell me everything about the area, or if an earthquake does happen, learn everything about the area. And then we are also working with our fantastic partners at Direct Relief, a fantastic humanitarian relief organization, and we are helping them to not only use the NOAA graph for their supply chain management in the future, but also for finding experts or finding boots on the ground. I'm going to talk about this in a second. So imagine the following scenario. This is, uh, by the way, Andrew Schroeder from Direct Relief. And one of the things that, that you know, we, we worked with them on or we modeled together was Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. Those two hurricanes hit the very same, or almost the very same spot <coughs> in Texas, I believe in 2020, if I remember correctly, or 2021. And they came really one after another with, I believe, six weeks or even maybe a little bit less, which means that the people who were evacuated from the first maybe hadn't yet returned home. So you couldn't send the evacuation coupons for hotels and shelters to them. And even more pressing, this is, of course, peak COVID time. So people would avoid the typical shelters and try to maybe evacuate somewhere else. So the tasks that people like Andrew at Direct Relief or Anna at Direct Relief had to, have to address is they need to understand what is the likely path of the hurricane, right? Then they need to know what happened in all the regions before, like COVID outbreak, previous hurricanes, like in this case, right? Then they need to understand the COVID situation, but not now, but you know, in, in a couple of days when the hurricane really gets there. And then they need to find the experts on the ground. Without the nowhere graph, our estimate, and keep in mind, every single disaster is different. We are not saying that these are the ultimate numbers that will apply to every disaster, right? If you would have to do this without the nowhere graph, and for every county of a larger region, or maybe even for city scale, you would have to pull all the previous events and integrate them. That would be a task for, you know, hours, right? If you would like to understand the COVID situation days from now, you may know that in the United States, we have roughly 50 COVID models, a forecast, each of them works differently for a specific state and county. So there is no best winner, you know, takes all model. So you would need to dive into this. You would need to look at all the models, figure out which is best. It's going to take you some time. And then of course, if you would like to find experts, if you already know the right people where you, you hey, you just need to get on the phone, right? But if you don't know them, and that's what Direct Relief is dealing with, then they are going on to many conferences with their colleagues. They, of course, have fantastically established networks with other humanitarian aid relief organizations. And then they are talking about who to match, who to contact, who has experience working with whom, and what kind of expertise they need, and so on. With the nowhere graph, all of this is reduced by at least a full order of magnitude. In fact, it, it boils down to a, you know, a couple of Spark queries, a little bit of clicking on the interface that I'm going to show you in a minute. So when I say 10 to 25 minutes, it's just, you know, we want it to be humble. Of course, you need to open the tool. You need to do the query. The query runs for a minute or so. So you take it with a grain of salt. So what exactly is in the graph and how exactly does all of this work? Well, I'm going to only use the next like 15 minutes of the time that I have here with you to give you a very rough impression but I hope it will inspire a little bit of an understanding of how this works under the hood. So from a very high, you know, 30,000 foot flyby, so to speak, looking out of the plane, there are two parts to the graph. There's the part that consists of all sorts of location identifiers. And then there's the data part, so to speak, in terms of all the data layers we serve about these regions. We have at least eight, I will tell you in a minute why at least, different types of place identifiers, so gazetteers, so to speak. 
we have climate divisions, we have zip codes, we have um, uh, market areas, needs market areas, we have FIPS code, we have national weather zones, we have global administrative areas at different um, regions and so on and so forth. So basically you can say, give me everything there is to know about the city, give me everything there is about this valley, give me everything about this mountain, this forest, this state park, this river, whatever you like, this mine even, if you like, because we have all features from, from GNS, LD, so we have you know, millions of those. But you know how this works. Disasters don't care about those predefined zones, which is one of the key problems with existing tools. So you can also create your own area. You can use our discrete hierarchical global grid. In fact, we are using Google's S2 to have a tessellation in a hierarchical grid over the entire surface of the earth down to level F13 right now, which is, I think, four square kilometers. And then you can pick your own set of zones of your own squares, so to speak, over the surface of the earth and draw your own area of interest. So once you have this, you either pick the geographic region or you define your own geographic area of, region, area of interest. You can get uh, millions and millions of facts from our data source, our knowledge graph. But keep in mind, we are also linked, they showed this before, right, to other knowledge graphs like Wikidata. So in fact, you're getting even many more billions from those. So what do you get from us? Well, those numbers are, are changing every day and the slide is a little bit outdated. I apologize for that. But we have roughly speaking 12 to 15 billion triples. Why 12 to 15? It depends on whether you count inferred statements or only the, so to speak, the non-inferable statements. But, you know, roughly speaking, we have 15 billion triples. So individual graph statements like a fire happened here, this caused this, this area is adjacent to this area, this flood event, you know, was caused by this and stuff like this, right? So to the best of our knowledge, and I have to be a little bit careful what I'm saying here, this probably makes us relatively high rank in the top three of the largest openly available knowledge graphs in existence. I'm having a hard time thinking about a bigger one than, you know, DBpedia and Wikidata and us. Of course, they are the, the private knowledge graphs of the Googles and Facebooks and LinkedIn's and, and Microsoft Bing's and many others. And word is, from what we heard, that they have roughly 60 billion triples, one of them. I'm not going into detail here. So, you know, we are, we are probably one of the biggest openly available knowledge graphs, publicly available knowledge graph, but even compared to the, you know, to the really, really big players, we, we, we can also, I think, hold our, our ground. But, but the numbers, of course, are not that important, right? I can enumerate the, or try to enumerate the natural numbers and have infinitely many triples, right? So what matters is that we have this across 27 different data layers. And by the way, this number is also outdated, it's more like 30 of all the transportation, the human health, smoke, air quality, fires, floods. I'm going to show you some examples later. But keep in mind, we are just not you know, putting data somewhere. We are already incurring the incredible cost, the pain of integration for you so that all the users of the nowhere graph don't have to do this over and over again, right? Keep in mind, that's our solution to the knowledge, to the, to the data acquisition bottleneck. We do this centrally using ontologies and semantics and machine learning techniques so that not everybody has to do this on their own. We are still growing. I hope that if you invite me back, let's say in, in next year's summit, I will say we have like 30 billion graph statements or something like this. So what is there? I apologize again, the talk is a little bit on short notice, the, the slide, slightly outdated. Some of the data sets we have is uh, soil properties, all the soil types, the soil characteristics, how well they hold water, how affected they are by erosion and stuff like this. All the wildfires in the United States since the 18, uh, since 1984, I believe 180,000 of them. All earthquakes over magnitude 4.5. Climate hazards since the 50s for the entire United States an expert network of COVID experts globally, a general expert network of, I believe, 30,000 experts as of now globally. Cropland, because as you saw, we also work on food safety and stuff like this. 
since 2008. Air quality observations from the EPA, every single sensor, every single air quality observation since 1980s. Smoke plume simulation since 2010 for all the fires we just discussed. Climate observations, disaster declarations by FEMA since the 50s, uh, blue sky forecasts, and so on and so on. So we have, and by the way, we also have forecast, we also have health data, transportation data, again, the slide slightly off. So what do we use to, to ontologically represent this and what do we use to infer, for instance, new statements in our graph? Well, there are, of course, two approaches that we use here and you will be very familiar with them, right? Of course, we use classical knowledge representation and reasoning. So we have a, a T-box that consists of a unified joint schema where each single ontology is composed of ontology design patterns. You know the names. This is work done by people like, for instance, Pascal Hitzler and his group, and of course, many others. It builds up on the, on the work that, that Gary mentioned. And in fact, it uses some of the, the, uh, the ontologies and ontology design patterns, like the trajectory ontology that, that Gary also co-authored. And of course, it's very heavily based on SSN, the Semantic Sensor Network Ontology, and SOSA, the sensors, observations, um, um, sample and, and actuation ontology that I was fortunate enough to, to co-edit and that is now an OGC as well as the W3C standard. So everything is basically an observation, which means that while there is a very big, you know, heterogeneity, so to speak, in terms of the types of data we have, at least the representation is very homogeneous by everything being observations. So querying this graph despite the massive amount of data and the many layers and is quite easy, right? So I'm, the, I'm, I'm digressing, sorry. So basically you have your classical uh, T-box, our, you know, our joint set of ontologies, I can talk about this later, and then our 15 billion triples SDA box. And then you can do whatever you would like to do with this kind of classical reasoning. You can do concept of some uh, subsumption. You can do instance checking. So for instance, giving a knowledge base, you can see whether a certain attainment holds true. That's great because it doesn't require any data, so to speak, for those rules, for those ontologies to formalize, but they don't work very well with in case of handling uncertainty or noise. So we are also making use of a lot of work from the machine learning literature, more specifically the representation learning literature, and even more specifically knowledge graph embeddings, a very interesting and very active research area since around 2012 or 2013, since the trans e paper, so to speak. And here we are learning high dimensional vector representations, or in fact, lower dimension as compared to a hot vector, but you know, it's still a couple of hundred dimensions for each of the entities and relations in our graph for those billions and billions. And then this allows you to predict new links in our graph, because keep in mind, initially the, the network, despite all its information, is sparse, at least in certain regions, and we want to mine new relations that are not yet known, for instance, causal relations between events. And that's one way of doing this. Of course, for this one, you really need a lot of high quality label data and all the problems that relate to bias and so on. And, but what you get in return is the ability to, to deal with, with noise and uncertainty. Here's just for your entertainment as the ontology community, an example of one of those patterns. This is a very generic one, talking about geometries and cells and hierarchies of cells and topological calculi. And you can see SOSA with the feature of interest and observations and stuff like this on the side. And this helps you to not only model topology, which of course we are using GeoSparkle for, but also combine this with a hierarchical calculus so that you can also use this discrete hierarchical global grid to get your data at different um, spatial mm -hmm. resolutions. And here you see just some of the axioms as an example. So that's the one way of reasoning, so to speak. And the other one is, of course, as I said, from representation learning, where you create essentially high dimensional vector spaces, and then you don't reason using entailment or query using certain entailment regimes, say in, in Sparkle or GeoSparkle, <coughs> but you compute the similarity, for instance, cosine similarity in these very high dimensional vector spaces to, for instance, understand things that may be similar or to perform tasks like doing prediction and so on. So just in case you may be thinking, or, and I haven't seen this year's uh, previous summit talks, but maybe somebody talked about portals, right? And that there's this portal and that portal, and at the end we are getting data about disasters. Well, here's the problem with portals. 
If you pick a port, wheel, for instance, from Texas, because our previous examples were from Texas, right? And you pick the port, wheel, for instance, for Harris County, you will see that they all look the same. Go out, pick your, pick your own county, look up their data port, it will always be the same. You get this data view that is always siloed in borders, that's the green one, a population, health, that's of course the heart, security, that's like the police officer there, the police person, uh, parks and recreations, traffic and so on. Sometimes they have like five categories, sometimes they have 10. Right? So you click on one and I'm going to click on one for you right now. Here I click and for instance, now I'm using the one from Houston and I click on the category. You see this here on the top of the screen in the group of flood hazards, right? We are talking today about disasters. So let's talk about floods. I want to get information about floods from such a portal. So I click on the portal, I click on the floods, and I hope to get tons of information about floods. But what do I get? I get one data set. And now please note the irony. The one data set from the Houston data portal that I got about floods is one about flood zones, so metadata, right? In other counties outside of Harris County, where of course Houston is located, right? So I didn't get anything about floods in the first place. And what I got was flood zones in counties that are not Harris nor Houston, right? So well, go figure how useful this is for you. And I'm not going to even mention that, of course, natural disasters don't care about city limits and county limits. So while you would have to go to each portal separately, um, the flood just you know runs across the street without considering that. And keep in mind that also these things age, right? Many of you have been in this game for many years, as I know. You have seen flash come and go, silver light come and go. Every time there's new technology, they redo those portals, right? So how, what is what we essentially serve, right? Let me just move my window here so that it's at least visually out of the way for me. This is our interface for direct relief. This is developed by our sub team at Arizona State University. They are a fabulous team around Ben Ben Lee in, in you know, the visual analytics part. So I, I think that looks quite pleasing. At the top, I'm just giving you a, a cutout, so to speak, of what you would see first. You would see a certain hurricane that you selected and you would see where it may land for, so to speak. And once you solve this, and once you've selected this event, you're going to get to the view that you see here in, on the big screen, so to speak. And you see different counties at the coast and you see different data layers. For instance, on the right hand, on the left hand side, you can see that I selected property damage on the log scale and the diabetes rate on the linear scale. And I can plot that, right? And I, of course, then get this per each of those counties. But I can also say for Hurricane Harvey in this case from 2017, I would like to have all the property damage, that's what you see on the right hand side, all the direct death, indirect death, direct injuries, human factor layers like diabetes rates, what have you, right? And they are all color coded on the map so that you can immediately click on them. And of course, I can also look at what exactly caused the damage. Was it the hurricane as such? Was it the flash flood? Was it the tropical storm that the hurricane turned into? Was this, you know, floods in general that occurred later on, or were these tornadoes that, that occurred due to the hurricane? And of course, whenever I click on the county, which I'm not doing here, it's, you know, it's just a screen from a demo, I would get all the information that I just said, right? All the damage, all the previous events, even the experts that know about these areas. And so, on. so long story short, what is the difference we make by our, you know, ontology driven nowhere graph in contrast to these data portals? Well, we don't serve links to just data sets. We don't say, well, go to this portal, hope there's a data set, download it, load it into R or MATLAB or your GIS, then do this for the next data set, then do your geographic analysis, and by then the, 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 you know, the, the flood is over. We are giving you direct AI ready, searchable access to every single observation, right? That explains the number of 15 million triples. So you can even run a query answer, a question answering system or a Spark query about all of this, where you can take your phone and say, hey, how many people were you know, killed in this and this event, or what is the, the damage to, to, to crop? Sorry for the dead people example. I think that's maybe a little bit too sad. Um, we are also doing this across different region identifiers, not by counties. Keep in mind, the fact that we are, we are tailoring the word into counties is just for admin reasons, right? 
natural disasters don't care about these borders, at least in most cases, right? And we also don't make we also don't make you download data sets, overlay data sets, analyze the data sets. We are directly answering your questions, right? You can run a Spark query, you can use this interface, you can even speak to your phone if you like, right? And then finally, we are creating based on semantics and ontologies, as you all know, smart data so that you can use any off-the-shelf software to work with our graph in contrast to using Flash, Silverlight, or all these proprietary technologies that will be out the window in five years. This is just one interface. We have multiple of those interfaces for farm credit associations, for FMI, for many other application areas, for the, you know, for the smoke plume one. This is just one of the examples. It's so easy to do them on top of our graph. So there are a couple of questions. I'm not sure whether, whether you, you care so much about them, but let me just briefly mention them. Knowledge graph embeddings are not invariant to syntactic, purely syntactic change. So that's a big issue. It's an, it's an open research question. It's a little bit of a, you know, a secret that is not openly voiced in the representational learning community that, that really affects the quality of the results there. Also, if you want to do the geo-enrichment, if you have tabular data and you just grow your data set, then um, you have a natural end for the, for the graph that we have. You can reach out everywhere. You can traverse the entire graph, right? So we need to work more on knowledge graph summarization. And of course, we need to understand regional build differences, cultural differences in semantics and knowledge representation. And of course, we need to be able to deal with the typical things that are involved in machine learning, detecting bias, mitigating bias, and so on. So I think I took three minutes longer than the 45 minutes I was promised or I was asked to do. I apologize for this. This is our team. We have big industry players. We have big data providers. We have some fantastic universities on the team. Today, let me give a specific shout out. All these teams are fantastic to OntoText, the triple store provider for GraphDB, who are giving us you know, a license time over time again. Thank you so much, folks. You guys are awesome. And this is our team. Not everybody from the team. The slide is not super up to date. <clears throat> we are roughly 50 uh, people. And, and, and that's we are. You also see our former team member, Lynn Usri here. You may know the, the bad news here. Let me just maybe close with this words. Lynn is a, was a long, long-term supporter of the semantics community, one of the key supporters of the geosemantics community when it was you know, still small, and one also of the key funding sources for many of us. And unfortunately, a couple of weeks, he, he passed away. OK, thank you so much, folks. I, I hope that was interesting, and I, I looking forward to your questions. Very, very exciting talk, uh, uh, Christoph. Uh, fantastic. And I see a lot of uh, integration in what we classically think of ontologies, metadata that are static. You derive them from your actual data, and the knowledge graph can be so rich. Thank you for explaining all this and also for different ways of querying for reuse and change detection. I have some questions on the chat, so are having others. I will open the floor now to people to ask questions. Thank you, Jano, once again. Please. Thanks for having me. Go ahead. Oh, I, I can ask. Um, I have some questions on the chat. First of all, thank you so much for this very uh, insightful and great projects. Uh, my question is towards the end users. So for example, I have the end users from other fields like health, healthcare, who wants to do the social determinant of health research. And this, this kind of data will be very useful. So do you have any very easy to use tools or APIs for the users to, you, you, I, you mentioned that we don't need to pull the data, but I think at the current stage, we probably still need to uh, put data into a workspace to um, use this data combined with other health data or bio data together. What is your thoughts? Well, that's, that's an exciting question. And thank you so much for, for asking a very important point. So keep in mind that in our case, what, what you would do is you would have your own data, for instance, the data that you have expertise in, like the health data, and then you would reach out and thereby suddenly get you know, billions and billions of other statements. 
So for instance, you may know about the stroke bed. Let me just give you an example. Well, let me start with an explain a comp a, a, with a with a, a with a disclaimer. I'm not a health expert, so I'm going to give you an example, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm, I'm not a medical professional. So there's, for instance, the stroke bed in the United States, right? And we don't know exactly why it's there and why people in a specific region suffer so much more frequently from strokes. But now with Nowhere Graph, we can learn all the millions of facts about this region, environmental factors, prevents events, transportation infrastructure, runoff of, of agricultural and pesticides or goods into the rivers like the Mississippi, how this accumulates downstream. We can all of the sun get immediate access to this. And you know, you can say, well, that was possible before. That's true. But before it was a big project. It was a data science project. Now it's click a button, run a sparkle query, wait 15 seconds, right? That's really a game changer. But let me add one thing. We have, we have I think, eight health variables like obesity and, and diabetes, and then six more, I forgot which, uh, which um, those are. But we are not alone in this. There's a fantastic project that I hope you guys are going to invite if you haven't so, namely the Spoke team. It's also um, nowhere gra in the Knowledge Graph team in the same NSF track that we are, and they deal exactly with this. They are the counterpart to us in that we stop at the human, so to speak. We, we talk about the human environment interaction, and they start with the human. They have all the diseases, they have all the medications, they have all the side effects of the medications, and boy, are they heavy users of ontologies. They have all the modern ontologies that you can think of that relate to health. So they would have probably the data that you have, and we are hoping to integrate with them. So both of these projects are trying to grow together and we are hoping that NSF is going to help with this. So maybe in a year, I'm going to have an even more exciting answer for you. By the way, there's yet another project that may be very relevant for you. That's the uh, uh, OKN project, the flooding project, also something you can, somebody you can invite. Excellent questions and response uh, to us. Uh, John Sowa has his hand up. John, okay. please go ahead. Yes, well, um, in uh, 2016, uh, Krzysztof gave a talk uh, at the Ontology Summit with the title, uh, Semantic Ont uh, Interoperability is an Oxymoron. And that was uh, just uh, five short slides, which I found very interesting and I agree with very strongly. And uh, the question I have is, how would uh, this new technology with uh, uh, knowledge graphs help or at least mitigate the problems of interoperability, semantic interoperability uh, that uh, Krzysztof discussed in 2016? Well, that's a fantastic question. Yeah. Luckily, I remember that talk. Otherwise, I would be in deep water. So I believe yes. the key statement I tried to make in 2016, and I'm, I'm still sticking with this, is that it's important to redefine or re-envision semantic interoperability as a lack of it, so to speak. So semantic interoperability, or in fact, I should say semantics and ontologies and reasoning isn't so much to maybe integrate everything beforehand, which is computationally impossible to do, but to understand which data sets not to combine. That was my argument, I guess. Right? So semantic interoperability, interoperability can be viewed as a technology or semantics can be viewed as a technology to help you prevent matching data that shouldn't be matched, right? So how does this in the talk to, of 2016 relate to this? And thanks again, because this is one of the most exciting questions uh, I, I think I have received recently. Well, there are two answers here. First of all, keep in mind that we are doing also a lot of machine learning and representation learning. And this is the first time that we really see those things, ontologies, in our case, based ontology design patterns and ontology alignments grow together with what we learn about, about um, representation learning, link prediction, and also um, you know, machine learning based ontology alignment. I think there's a lot of very interesting stuff there. Uh, but now to the, you know, to the more nuanced part of your, of your very interesting question. What we do is we really invest you know, thousands of hours. Keep in mind, we are a very big team running this since one and a half years. To do exactly what you said, we are creating the ontologies, pain strikingly integrate the data, and then compute the connections like which events, which, which counties, which regions are adjacent, which event, <coughs> excuse me, which event took place where and so on. 
so that you don't have to do this. It remains a very difficult, very hard to do task, right? And when it comes to the alignment of ontologies, what we do is we use, make heavy use of existing standards like SOSA, SSN, GeoSparkle, and then we add our own ontology design patterns to that. By the way, Shirley Stevens, who is also on the, on the slide here, she works on our hazards and disaster ontology. If you would like to invite her, as does Mark Schildhauer, who's also on the slide. I hope that's a good answer to your question. I'm medium happy with my answer, so I'm going to come back to you by email. We probably should have a follow-on session with a lot of QAs, but continue, please. Robert Roveto has his hand up. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, thanks, Jano, for your talk. Uh, it was uh, a great one. Um, I've admired your work for, for a long time. Uh, and there were a number of points, number of topics you raised that uh, just wanted to, to re-emphasize again. Uh, so I suppose maybe it's more of a uh, just more of a comment uh, to reflect your uh, your presentation. Um, the first point was uh, when you emphasized relationships in particular as a, as a focus area for uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, and I wanted to reiterate uh, your point because uh, I, I do agree that I, th I think it's an undertreated uh, topic in general uh, across uh, the modeling space, whether it be uh, knowledge graphs in the contemporary sense or ontologies or or other sorts of models. Um, the second uh, point I wanted to reiterate was um, uh, your nice slide about the differences between classical knowledge representation uh, and uh, representation learning uh, involving uh, dimensional vectors and um, some of the limits uh, of classical knowledge representation. Uh, I think it's uh, that highlights uh, sort of a, an, an important point of looking at various techniques and, and approaches that might be um, that might not be known to our uh, our community here uh, that may be focused more on classical uh, knowledge representation and then and then more recently what uh, the topic on semantic interoperability uh, and sort of reimagining re what it is uh, and also uh, getting into uh, perhaps clarifying some of the misconceptions about uh, semantic interoperability. And one reason I also wanted to reemphasize your point on, uh, and the discussion on that is, um, I, there's, uh, I have a, uh, uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, interoperability in terms of semantics, uh, at least in certain senses is, is actually feasible, uh, given the, the fluidity and the dynamic aspect of, of, uh, of meaning both in formal representations and in our, uh, natural, uh, mental capacities. So I, I personally have a number of questions whether uh, it's it even makes sense, the concept, uh, given that it is a very mind internal, uh, uh, a mind internal phenomenon rather than a purely uh, 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 physical symbol structure aspect in, in computational systems. Um, so these are just some points. I, I guess I just wanted to reiterate it and I just wanted to, you know, thank you for your talk again. Um, and if you're open to a call offline, I think I have some ideas that you might be interested in, if you're open to that. Over. Well, I'm, I'm always open for a good chat, right? And you certainly gave a great summary. Your, your summaries were probably better than my talk. And it only took you like two minutes while I was like rambling for 15. And so, you know, I, I really have to comment on what you said, because I think it's, you, you, you brought these topics together quite nicely. So let me try to, to synthesize some of this. Um, first of all, this community, of course, is a very long standing in, in, in issues of semantics and ontology and knowledge representation. So it would be maybe interesting to have a follow up that discusses yeah. how uh, is our work changing in the light of representation learning. And, you know, I'm a visitor to the field of machine learning. Many people think about me as a machine learner just because I publish this kind of work. I'm really only a visitor to this field. And I have to say that the progress there is quite substantial. For instance, my student, Ling Kai, she's also on the slide, she's absolutely brilliant. She, um, we, we just co-authored a paper and, and it's under review that shows that you can do entirely RCC8-based reasoning, so region connection calculus, eight-based style, classical, you know, 80s knowledge representation reasoning systems in or using knowledge graph embeddings and even better than those classical reasoning systems so things are changing, right? And also the question that you mentioned, and you know, again, that was a brilliant summary about differences in conceptualization. Now suddenly we can quantify these differences, whether they are real, right? 
and how to address them. But the point that really struck, hit me most about this summary was something where I think there's a, there's a deep unanswered question here that most people just gloss over, right? Namely, what goes into a knowledge graph? What should be represented? The reason why we focus on relationships like topological relationships is because others focus historically on geometry, like you know, all the detailed geometries for every single county, river, and stuff like this. We also have this just because you know I was too afraid to skip this and get you know a beating from others, but it's useless. No human being is asking for you know the millions of individual points that jointly form a polygon that represents a lake in Michigan, right? So the topological relations like this is near that, or in fact, you know, that's a metrically refined one, I'm sorry. This is adjacent to this, this is inside of that. Same for temporal calculi like ends, way more important. So I agree with you with your point there. But when I think about what's the key problem, then I would say the key problem is that if you design a great ontology and let this sink in, I would love to hear, hear John Silva's reply to this. A great ontology makes a miserable query path. The, the greater, the more detailed, the more fine-grained your model, the longer the query chain in your knowledge graph becomes. And that becomes really a big issue if you want to query. Our knowledge graph is full of reifications because we want to have temporal scoping, we want to have spatial scoping, we want to have you know, a proper ways of representing multiple geometries of stuff. We want to talk about confidence of assigning experts to topics, but this makes for horrible queries. So unfortunately, bad ontologies make for fast knowledge graphs and good ontologies make for miserable knowledge graphs. So where is the, you know, the Goldilocks zone? I don't know, I don't know. But if you know, I would love to talk more about this. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? We should have a follow on. There's a lot, especially on this point that Robert raised. And I see that in knowledge graph, you are embedding or at least including what I would have thought of explicit ontology, but it's already appearing to be embedded. It's also when you talk about when you are adding temporal aspects, but all of that you are keeping online. Uh, how hard is it for your internal software to process it in real time for real user queries? Well, it's, that's a good one. So the, the, the ontologies consist, uh, ontology consists of a couple of hundred classes and relations. It's, it's big, but it's not super big, right? It's, it's a, a shallow ontology that is growing deeper and deeper with the, providing a better and better axiomatization. Uh, the hazard ontology is something that will really need a community. We can't do this on our own. Interestingly, there's no good modern disaster and hazard ontology. So we're working on it, but we need your support. We need support of other groups, right? So that was the T-box part. The, what about the A-box? Well, as I said, we have roughly 50 billion graph statements. We use the very performant knowledge graph, a triple store, sorry, uh, from, from um, uh, onto text MD graph DB, running on a machine with half a terabyte main memory, 24 terabytes of uh, RAID 6, I believe, system, 24 you know, very modern CPU cores, and Queries can be very fast, even complex ones run and by very fast, I mean, you know, in sub second. But those, especially that use GeoSpark, that's a, a really a showstopper. They can take many seconds, 10, 20, 30. And we can also come up with queries that run minutes or that would even run many, many hours. If you would like to have a brief insight or an intuition, my thinking is that if you look at the query scheduler, and luckily in GraphDB, we can, you can inspect the query scheduler using like an, an examine keyword. Whenever there's an index, of course, it's going to put this index first. But if you have a very large spatial index and a rather simple rest of the query, it's still going to pull the spatial index first, which makes for very, very slow queries. So if you just do a GeoSpark query super fast, if you just do a simple, show me all things that are of type fire super fast. If you say, show me fires in California, that can take long. Yeah. By now we have really figured it out. So it's, you know, in, in, in a couple of seconds. 
but it's a big issue. And the last point to your question, how easy or how difficult is it to keep this running? Well, unfortunately, it's really difficult. We, we don't have the expertise yet to do this. It's Very good, easy. excellent. Lot of infrastructure. I am open to a follow on discussion, uh, depending on uh, your schedule and so on. And we can agree on dates uh, uh, offline. Um, fantastic, it's just, uh, the, the topmost questions still in my mind are on the uh, relevance and uh, closeness to reuse, situational awareness definition, how much of provenance goes into it and how much future predictions can go hand in hand and so on. There are a lot of questions, but you have a very rich representation in nowhere graph. Thank you. Um, great question. I have to admit that, of course, we are very aware of, of the need for provenance, but unfortunately, the amount of provenance we provide is minimal. Essentially, where did we get the data from? You know, what kind of data is in the graph? And let me be honest, this is about it. I would love to include more provenance, and we know how important this is, but we are not exactly sure how to do this because current provenance frameworks are really based on triple level provenance. So keep in mind what this would do to our 50 billion triples already, right? There are some ideas that we are exploring like hashings of triples and then have a separate knowledge graph that only have provenance information that relates to each of those hashes. But of course that's not reversible and stuff like this. This also work from, from the uh, Freie University, I believe, and in Amsterdam working on topics like this. So if you are by any chance an expert in provenance and have some 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 good clues then yeah let's discuss them in the, in a the follow-up chat i would love that thank you uh ken with your permission i think we are at a time when we should uh, sign off because we have gone over our allotted time a bit uh, any yes, other sir. comments from ken before we close yeah we we should it would be good to follow up on some of these Things. For example, the, um, the work I did on knowledge graphs that make it much easier to do provenance information by having all of your uh, triples be reified automatically. Um, but we can deal with that in a follow-up. Yes. Okay, so I'll stop recording.